the one out in the vestibule after service. If you want to purchase tickets for the spaghetti slurp, you can just see her. She'll be sitting at the table, and uh, she'll be happy to help you out there. Also, I want to make mention, and this has been in the bulletin two weeks, but we have two deacon positions that need to be filled at our next business meeting, which is coming up in April. I am said April, but I looked at it, it says February. It's coming up in February. If you would like to nominate somebody for that position, please put it in writing, give it to one of the deacons, which would be Brother Tony right there, or Brother Roy right here, or you can give it to myself. And uh, so far I've had none turned in, you've had one week, you've had a couple weeks yet, but uh, if there's somebody that you think would be wonderfully qualified, um, please let us know. Then we put the pressure on them. Let's see, there's a children's ch church change, and uh, Sister Tammy, I said Tammy, I just mixed up all my points here today. Sister Amy, Tammy's right behind you, uh, is taking a breather from children's church, and uh, my wife will be taking that downstairs, and Donna is going to be helping her. And Sister Dykeman is going to be taking care of the youngest ones. So don't leave the service until the music's finished. When you see my wife head out, then all of the other ones can head out. But if you head out before that, there's no way. So don't leave early. There's a few people. Oh, Jeremy's not here, but the Financial Peace University begins next Sunday. Uh, there's a few people that are sick that I want to make mention of. Uh, Sister Malvia Davis, who of course is in your Sunday school class, she slipped and fell yesterday, and she's just very stiff and sore and asked that we can remember her in prayer. Uh, Brother Sip, and Sister Sip are not here. Uh, Brother Sip has come down with something. Uh, he's got chills and fever, and he doesn't really know what it is because uh, he's not going to see the doctor until tomorrow. Um, Sister Simpson has pneumonia, and it's in one of her lungs, so we need to be praying for her, and I know that there's a lot of sickness that goes around this time of the year, and I believe that we can cry out to the Lord, and He still hears and answers the prayers of His people, amen? And on that note, I have one other announcement to make, um, it has nothing to do with our announcements. Yesterday, the day before yesterday, was our in-reach downstairs. We had ham. We had ham and beans, we had cornbread, uh, it was a fabulous meal, coleslaw, desserts, grapes. Now you're going to hope I can preach real short because you're hungry. But we had some new people that had never been there, and we had a lady that came back again. And it was the lady that my wife read the note the other Sunday about, that the money was to God and she wanted to contribute. When she was here the last time, downstairs, she had her arm in a brace. And uh, her hand was terribly swollen, and she was having trouble moving it, and it was giving her a lot of problems. And she asked if we would pray for her hand. And I had Sister Mary Dell come over, and Sister Aline and myself, and we laid hands on her, and we prayed that God would touch her hand. She came back this uh, past week, and she showed it to me. She said, look, look, all the swelling was gone. She didn't have to have the brace. She said she went back to the doctor, and she told me, uh, two weeks ago that sometimes her arthritis flares up so bad and that happens to it and, and she was wanting us to pray that the Lord would help with that arthritis. She went to the doctor they couldn't find any arthritis. And the doctor said, I don't know why you're on pain medicine. She said, well, you'd have saw it before, you'd have understood it. And uh, she said that the Lord had touched and healed her. And uh, so I just want to report that to the church. Uh, God still moves and he still reaches out and touches people today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's just take a few moments Praise the Lord and to also ask God to meet the needs of our church. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord, that you are moving and doing supernatural things in our midst. And Father, we just thank you. We thank you, O Lord, because you care for people and, and you would reach out to speak to their hearts and you use us in the process and we're just honored, O Lord, to be your servants. And Father, we pray that you would minister and touch those in our church that are sick. We pray, Lord, for Brother Seth this morning. Uh, that the, the fever and the chills would go away, O oh Lord, that you would move in and that the sickness would have to flee. We pray, Father, that you would also touch Sister Simpson as she's at her house with pneumonia. I pray, Lord, that that lung would clear up. I pray, Father, that the coughing would stop. I pray, Lord, that she would know that you have touched her, O oh God, today. And, Father, we also pray, Lord, for Malvia Davis, that you would touch her, 
uh, after her fall and that you would strengthen her body. Lord, we ask that you would have your way with all the needs that have not been mentioned this morning. And Lord, we are just grateful to be able to bring them to you because we know that you care. Hallelujah. Father, we ask that you would have your way in everything else that's done in this service. In Jesus' wonderful name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen and amen. It's a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 If you want, you can stand with me as we join in the worship this morning.
time the children are going to be dismissed. Go downstairs to Children's Church. Happy faces. Swirling skirts. <laughs> Our children are just so absolutely adorable. Amen. I did see some of our children today that ride the bus. I don't know. I don't think they're here. Um, but I do want to make mention that on Sunday evenings, we almost always have a fine little crew of kids that are sitting right here on the front row of the church. And usually every single one of them that are sitting there don't have family members in church to come without them. And uh, I encourage you just to show your love to them. Uh, I know that the one family of children that was this past week, their mother went back to prison. Uh, my wife was telling me during the church service last Sunday, I think it was on Monday she went back to prison, and my wife watched the one little girl sit there and just chew her nails the whole time. And she said, we don't realize sometimes what's happening in the lives and the hearts of the little kids that are here in the church. Uh, so I encourage you to engage with them, to shower love on them, and uh, let them know that you care about them. Amen? If you feel like coming up and sitting with them, sit with them. I'm not going to care if you're on the front row. If you feel obligated to leave the front row when I start preaching, I'll accept that. I don't want to spit on nobody. But uh, I just encourage you to, to shower the love of the Lord on those children. Amen? Last week we began a sermon that we are going to complete today. Uh, last week's sermon was entitled The Transformational Path and uh, the Promises. It was actually the Transformational Promises and we looked at several promises that are found in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 11 uh, verse 1 through verse 11 and last week we saw first of all that God would give us everything that we need for life and God that's a big, that's a big supply. I think that's a bigger sack than what Santa Claus carried at Christmas time. God will give you everything that you need. Uh, then we found out that we become partakers of the divine nature. There's genuine supernatural change for the believer that the Lord offers. And then we said some promises are conditional. And there were two conditional promises. One is that we will not fall, and one is that we will not fail. But the first two promises was so that this path of transformation would occur. God's going to give you everything you need to have your life transformed for His glory. Second of all, uh, God is going to cause the change in your life to be supernaturally changed. It's not reformation. It's by the power of His Spirit. And then the two conditional promises at the end that you will never fail or that you will never fall is assuming that you utilize what God's given you in the beginning to accomplish his purpose. And in that case, you will never fall and you will never fail. There has been a lot of time when I was growing up that I was scared to death I was not going to make it happen. I tell you, it's a very sobering thought to think that you may not make it to heaven. But it is possible for a person to miss out with the Lord. There was kids in my Bible school class when I went to Bible school that are not serving the Lord today. And at one time they were on fire for Him. You know people like that too. At one time they serve the Lord, but today they don't serve the Lord. Well, the question is, why does that failure occur? Why did they fall if the, if the Bible gives us a promise? You don't have to fall. You don't have to fail. Then we find out that the path that God made for them that secures that promise was not followed. So today, instead of looking at the promises that was made, which are incredible, today we're going to look at the path that we're going to follow if we are going to secure those promises that are conditional for ourselves. 1 Peter, sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 1 through 11, I will read that passage one more time. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us 
Through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to virtue and glory, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or love. For if these things be in you and abound, it's growing in you. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence, there's that word again, to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Before I jump into the text where I want to be, I just want to mention something about one thing here. I am on, Anna. It talks about being blind and not being able to see afar off. That doesn't sound like the same thing to me. How can you be blind but not able to see far off? There's two words that's happening there. One is a blindness. There's a spiritual blindness that can occur to a person. But what happens is, is they become nearsighted. Now, how many of you in here are nearsighted? I'm nearsighted. That's why I wear glasses. If I didn't wear glasses, I wouldn't have to really look at you. I could look at you and not look at you. I see colors, but I cannot see eyes, nose, mouths, just blurs. Um, there's something precious about that on occasion. Just keep talking to me. It doesn't make me sick when I see there on your face or whatever other problems happening, you know? But spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, we want to be able to see at a distance. I don't want to only see right here around me. The person that can only see right around them is the person that is absorbed with themselves. It's the cares of life. It's the concerns of them. All they see is the natural, the things that are close, but they can't see afar off they are blind spiritually. We don't want that to be our condition. We don't want to forget that the Lord purged us from our sins. And when he purged us from our sins, he gave us a high and a holy calling to pursue. So the pursuit is what we're looking at this morning. Giving all diligence, he says, add to your faith. Virtue. Add to your faith virtue. There's two options when it comes to your faith as a believer. It can either flourish or it can wither. Plants can flourish or wither. Uh, Mama has Christmas cactuses at the house. Some of her plants are absolutely enormous in great big pots. When they bloom, it's spectacular. And then all of them fall off onto the floor, all the blooms. And that's spectacular, too. <laughs> she actually has a piece of it that broke off that she stuck in a cup of water, and it bloomed without roots. Now, that's a green thumb. It's flourishing. And now it's starting to spread out roots, and she's going to turn it into her own little plant. But if that piece that broke off landed on the floor and was not cared for by her, 
it would wither. And withering takes you to one place, death. You can wither or you can and die, or you can flourish and you can grow as a Christian. And so we are desiring that we would grow. The scripture nowhere promotes you getting in a rut that I might would call a maintenance mode where you're just happy with the status quo, content with where you are in your spiritual life. It doesn't do that. It always promotes growth, growth, growth. And how is it that that growth is going to be accomplished? The word came up more than once, diligence. Diligence. The word diligence means intense effort. I have to decide I am going to make it and I'm going to walk the path and I have my mind made up. Nobody is turning me around. I have one place to go, one place only, and that's heaven and further into the will of God. There's something I want you to know about the fruit of the Spirit. Laziness is not one of them. Laziness is not a fruit of the Spirit. If I get lazy in my spiritual life, I can tell you one thing. The Holy Spirit is not motivating that. The Holy Spirit does not motivate laziness. So once a person gives their heart, their life to the Lord, and they, are, they have faith now, Jesus is the author of the faith, the scripture says, add to your faith virtue. Virtue. Virtue is not a word we use very often again. There's a lot of words in the scriptures that we don't use frequently. Uh, the word virtue here doesn't mean what you might would think. You see, just like the word love in the scriptures has like seven different Greek words and they all have different meanings, there's more than one word for virtue in the scripture. Now, if you remember, Jesus is walking along and a woman presses through the crowd and she touches the hem of the garment that the Lord was wearing. And he said, who touched me? Because he perceived that virtue had went out of him. That's a different virtue. It's a different word altogether. That word virtue there has to do with supernatural power that left Christ and affected that woman. But the word virtue here is different. It means valor. It means moral excellence. In fact, when you go back and you study the history of the Greek language, which I'm not a scholar, but I got books that help me out. They trace the root of this word, or they actually trace the beginning, I should say, of this word to the word manliness. Manliness. Add to your faith manliness. Now, for you women out there, we want some manly women. No, we want womanly women. <laughs> but the reason it had to do with manliness is that it was used in military senses where the person that was the man in the military was courageous. Valor or valiant. He would fight valiantly. And that is how this word comes down to us now here in the scripture where we find out that we are going to be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might, and we are going to have moral integrity. We're strong about doing the things that are right. His moral power is working inside of us. Now, at its core, if you ask me, well, Pastor, boil that down for me in a nutshell. Add to your faith what? And this is what I would say to you. It means once you get saved, grow up. Grow up. Don't be happy being a baby Christian. Decide for yourself that you want something more out of life than for other people to feed you, burp you, and change your diaper. Now, a spiritual infant 
is a baby in the Lord, and it's a precious thing when a person is a new convert, and they don't know a lot, but they love the Lord, and we all love to see that, don't we? Absolutely. The Lord loves to see that too. But He tells you that He has given you everything you need so that baby stage in your life can turn into manliness, into courage, into adulthood as a person. And the reason why goes back to that word being used for people in the military because your Christian walk is a battle. It's a battle for your very soul. If a person took an infant and laid them on the concrete and walked away from it, they couldn't survive the battle of the elements. When a person first gets saved, people are encouraging, they're around them, they love them, and things are happening. But if they end up just getting exposed to the elements, you know what's going to happen? They're going to wither. They're going to go blind. They're going to fall. They're going to fail. So now this growth needs to happen. Give all diligence and add to your faith virtue. That's step number one. Number two, add to your virtue knowledge. Knowledge. The word knowledge means doctrine. It means awareness and it means intelligent insight. Those are the ways that that is translated. Add to your faith virtue or grow up and then add to that knowledge, doctrine, intelligent insight and awareness. What does this mean? When a person starts maturing spiritually, they want to learn more. How do we learn more? We start studying God's word for ourselves. That's the difference between a mother putting a bottle in your mouth and you taking a spoon and scooping the cereal in for yourself. That's part of what happens when a person grows up. And so you begin to study God's word. You start going to Sunday school because you want to know what the teachers in the church are teaching. You start wanting to attend Wednesday night Bible class because we're going deep starting now, aren't we, Brother Matthews? Woo! We're getting into Daniel. And we're getting into the prophecy. Yuck. That's not baby food. That's one of them steaks that's got a crystal in it you got to work around. <clears throat> I recommend listening to Christian talk radio. You can listen to very good things that is going to help you get more knowledge of God's word through things like that. Now, yes, we can do all kinds of other stuff instead. But there are very specific things we can do that help us to add knowledge to our Christian walk. So the first thing is first. We're in a war. We're in a war. Second thing that's going to happen right here is we get rid of carnal thinking. Carnal thinking is going to minimize the importance of the scriptures. If you are carnal, it's not important to you. I engaged with a girl this past week. I'm in a, a major Facebook debate. It's exciting. And finally she came out and she told me she's a Christian, but she doesn't believe that most of the Bible is true. Well, baby Christians, you either better grow up or you're going to wither and die. Can't have it both ways. Can't have it both ways. Now, when it comes to adding biblical knowledge to our lives, Amy, it's good to see you in church. When it comes to adding biblical knowledge to our lives, that's not always fun, is it? It is not always fun. We don't always enjoy pouring and studying and meditating. Sometimes you hit roadblocks and you have to read something two or three times to figure it out. But when a person joins the military, it's no longer about only what's fun. Sometimes you do what's necessary. It's not always fun to give up some of your time to engage in the work. But you're a soldier now. You've enlisted. You have enlisted. What did you expect? What did you expect? Okay. We add to our virtue, knowledge. And now we add to our knowledge, temperance. Temperance. Temperance simply means self-control. That's what it means. But in the spiritual sense... 
And in the sense that we have here in the scriptures, it's not this kind of self-control where I am controlling myself. It's the kind of self-control that the Holy Spirit is working in me to bring discipline into my life. Discipline, control, but spirit-empowered control. Here's the difference. Self-control without the Holy Spirit would be me taking an anger management class. And I'm learning how to control my emotions and my behavior. But when the Holy Spirit comes in and he begins to work anger management, it's not because of a class, it's because of his empowerment. You're learning and now you're following the voice of your spirit and discipline is coming into your life. Self-control or temperance uh, would be the difference between fasting because you want to lose 10 pounds and fasting to hear from the Lord. One is simply self-rigor, but the other is spiritually empowered. Now, if the Lord tells you you need to fast to lose them 10 pounds, go for it. But better above and beyond that to seek His face. Amen? Add to temperance patience. 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 Patience is steadfastness. Patience is endurance. Endurance. This isn't the kind of patience where I go to the doctor's office, I sign in, I sit down in my chair, and my appointment was a half hour ago. And then I need patience. That's what we think of as patience, right? In that case, patience is boredom. Patience is waiting to have anything accomplished. That's the kind of patience we usually think. That is not the kind of patience that's being used here in the scripture. Because the kind of patience that is happening here in the scripture is going the distance. It is active. It is not passive. It's an active patience. I am going the distance even if there's opposition. It doesn't matter. Patience is going to cause me to persevere. I'm going to keep on going. Chuck Swindoll said something one time. It was excellent. He said something excellent more than once, but this is the thing I'm going to say today. Think of the scriptures as an absolutely accurate map. A map tells you how to get to a certain destination. But looking at that map does not automatically transport you to that destination. It won't take you to England or to Arizona or to Peru. In order to get to that destination, and the map will show you exactly how to get there. It means that I have to pay close attention. I have to have some effort. I will pay the cost and take the time for the journey. Patience is getting somewhere, but realizing that it is a journey. I am going somewhere in my relationship with the Lord, but it's a process and I will persevere. That is the kind of patience that we have here. Jesus mentioned this kind of patience in the book of Luke when he was talking about the parable of the soils. He said in Luke chapter 8 verse 15, But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, that's over here, hearing the word, which we've already added that, the knowledge, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. That's with perseverance. That is with endurance. Even children sing the song that says, take this whole world and give me Jesus. That's commitment to follow him. But then they turn around and say, though none go with me, still I will follow. That is patience. Patiently enduring what may be difficult in the journey. So once we add patience onto the list of things, then it says we add to the patience that endurance Godliness. Godliness. Godliness is right conduct in the sight of God. Right conduct in the sight of God. And it's related to the word reverence. The reason that it's rated, related to the word reverence is because if I walk right in the sight of God 
through the course of my week, that is giving honor to him. That is reverence. Some people think that reverence is when you come to church and just stand there like this. That's reverence. But reverence is more. Reverence is acknowledging him in all your ways. Acknowledging him in all your ways. So it is holy conduct. And that's where we get a little sidetracked sometimes uh, with the word holiness. Because some people want holiness to only mean when Christ forgave me my sins. But there is a sense of holiness that is my right conduct before the Lord. And so if you want to be a holy Christian, then what that means practically is that your conduct is going to be that kind of conduct that becomes righteousness or godliness. Men and women who have left off their spiritual childishness, they engage themselves in God's word. They begin walking in the spirit instead of fulfilling the lust of the flesh. They're committed now to a journey. Uh, they're not making any excuses for the sins that are in their lives. Now instead, they're becoming an example of the believer by their conduct. This is the tipping point on the path of growth to where a person now, because they are an example of the believer, might become a Sunday school teacher. They might take a leadership position in the church. Why? Because a person can look at their life and say, I want to be like them. Godliness. That doesn't mean that the person who's not qualified is not a Christian. It means that they've got growth yet in their journey before they get to this place where other people's going to look at them and say, yes, I see Jesus in them. I see the love of the Lord in them. You say, well, pastor, that's me. I teach a high school class. I must be pretty good. Uh, people can look at me. I just grown up all the way. There's more. There's more. You add to your godliness brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness is kindness to your brothers and sisters in the faith. This is talking about inside of the church. Now we're looking beyond myself and my own spiritual growth, and I'm starting to take an interest in other people's spiritual growth and other people's walk with the Lord. Jesus expressed this type of thing when he washed the disciples' feet. Brotherly kindness takes you into the realm of servanthood. You are a servant of the Lord now, and you are willing to serve other people. Brotherly kindness. Most of you are familiar with D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody said, show me a church where there is love, and I will show you a church that is a power in the community. He said in Chicago a few years ago, a little boy attended a Sunday school. By the way, a few years ago is over 100 years ago now for D.L. Moody. He said, a little boy attended Sunday school I know of, and when his parents moved to another part of the city, the little fellow still attended the same Sunday school, although it meant a long and tiresome walk every day. A friend asked him why he went so far. He said, there's a lot of other good churches that are close, and he said, they might be good for other people, but they're not good for me. And that person looked at him and said, well, why not? He said, because they love a little fellow over here. He sensed that brotherly kindness extended to him. You want a church to be strong? Then we need to grow to where we have brotherly kindness, which develops into unity within the body of believers. And when churches develop that, there's still more growth to be done. Because the Bible says, add to brotherly kindness, charity. Now, brotherly kindness is charity. I mean, brotherly kindness is love. It's love for brothers and sisters in Christ. It's love within the church. So when he adds on to that charity, he is now saying, love people that aren't Christians. And he's taking it to what I would consider to be the pinnacle of following Christ. And that is loving the unlovable. 
and loving people that don't deserve the love that you give them. This follows the command of Christ. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, he said, Love your enemies. And do good, sorry, and bless them that curse you. And do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And I can't tell you how many times people that are in churches say, Well, I can't do that. And all I can say is you're probably right. Because your Christian walk is a walk of growth. And you need to add to your faith and add to your faith as that empowerment is there to cause you to grow. Pretty soon you realize if his empowerment can take you all the way up to brotherly kindness, which sometimes is rough, he can take you over the edge to loving the world. Because you see, that's the very thing that Jesus did. A world that despised him, a world that rejected them, he loved them enough to die for them. He gave you everything you need to follow this path. That's what he already said. He gave you everything that you need that pertains to life and godliness. We find out that he gives us a supernatural change. And that supernatural change is so as we follow the path, everything that happens is supernaturally occurring. It's not simply me forcing myself to behave a certain way. Any religion can do that. This is the Spirit of God moving through you. And if we are honest with Him, and if we are willing to abound, abound into the things of God, we will not fail. We will not fall. Where are you on the path today? I can't answer that question for you. I don't know where you are. I'm not criticizing you if all you have is baby faith. I'm glad you got faith. But I want you to know the Lord wants you to add to your faith. Grow up. Virtue. He wants you to be manly about your faith. He wants you to be a man of God. He wants you to be a woman of God. He wants you to engage in the battle. You say, well, I've started to do that. Well, then add to that knowledge of the Word of God. And there's always room for more knowledge of the Word of God. Brother Matthews likes to come to the church. He likes to hash things out with me. And we wrangle and we wrangle over stuff. And you know, sometimes I... I think, oh, that's good to think about. I have to really think about that. I don't tell you because that goes to the big head, you know. And, <laughs> and sometimes he wrangles things around and he'll come back to me later and he'll go, well, I, I can accept this thing. The truth is, it doesn't matter where you are in your spiritual experience. That one just keeps on multiplying. You say, well, I'm engaging in God's Word. I started a reading plan, and, and I'm reading a little piece of the Bible every day uh, this year, and by the end of the year, I'm going to read it all. I started that, and I say to you, wonderful, I'm glad that you started that. Now you're going to add to that patience, and that's the endurance that's going to see you through to the end, even if there's obstacles. You say, I'm facing obstacles, and I'm still pressing on, and I'm going to make it okay. Then it's time for you to be the example of the believer. It's time for you to be a mature Adult Christian, it's time for you to be godly. There's going to be some sins we've got, got to stop making excuses for. I don't care if your hair is red. That doesn't give you an excuse to slap your wife. You know, I mean, people have all kinds of excuses for their behavior. But the truth is, is in the sight of God, He gave you everything you need to take the next step so you'd be godly. And so you'd start being like Jesus. You say, well, I'm starting to do that. I'm going to say, start treating the people in the church better. Start calling people that are sick. Start engaging with people within the church and show them your concern and show them your love and stop being a little person that sits like a bump on the log and comes and goes and nobody ever gets to know anything besides you besides that. Show love in the body. And when you're done with that, say, God, give me a heart that would let me to say if I was suffering for you, if I ended up overseas, it could happen in America time, but if I was overseas, and I was in one of the Muslim countries, and they're going to persecute me and perhaps take my life for my faith. Help me to help them. See, when you put it that way, folks, we all have room to crawl. So we need an honest assessment of ourselves. Where are we? And what is it that we can do? Not because we can do it, but because God can empower us to become the thing that he wants us to be. Let's bow our heads. Precious Heavenly Father, 
We are so grateful for your word because it challenges us and it causes us to realize, Lord, that we have a fight in front of us and we have a path, but you've walked it before us, O oh Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would follow after you, that we would give diligence to the things in our life that are the most important, and it's not the TV program that we're addicted to. It's your word. It's your will. It's the voice of your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that there would be men and women of faith that would arise up in this church that would become godly and God-fearing, an example for the believer that would show forth love at all times and in all seasons. <clears throat> Lord, it's the path you have, and even though it seems impossible, you make it possible because your Holy Spirit dwells within. May we walk in faith and believe you for more. In Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone said...